making dua for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Allahumma abdil khawfahum amna. Allahumma ahfadhum bi ra'ayatika ya arkram al-akramin. Allahumma arham mawtahum wa taqabbalhum shuhada. Allahumma ja'al awladahum faratan lahum. Allahumma warudda al-muslimina ila deenika maraddan jameela. Ameen. Brothers and sisters, today, insha'Allah, we are going to talk about the topic, those who desire paradise. Let us talk about Jannah. Let us talk about how do we get there. Let us talk about what is it. Let us talk about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softens our hearts and washes our worries. The topic of Jannah always brings calmness to the heart. And in a world of turmoil that we live in at the moment, in a world of worry, sadness, tragedy, as people busy themselves with materialistic things trying to forget, it is always good to go back to the Qur'an and let Allah speak to us, to take us away from this world for a moment, which is better than any movie you can watch, any music that you listen to, any story that anyone can tell you any enjoyment in this world, for everything in this world is temporary. And to talk and take ourselves away from the reality of this world to the true reality that is yet to come. Jannah, the gardens, paradise, the everlasting abode, the end of all things. And of course, one of the end of all things is its opposite. Hellfire, wal'ayyad billah. My brothers and sisters, Jannah, is what brings everyone hope and makes the Muslim keep going, no matter what struggles, what tragedies, what sadness that they go through, what problems in life, to know that the, at the end there is something installed. All we have to understand is that right now is the time of working. Right now is the time of patience. Now is the time of perseverance. Now is the time of commitment. Now is the time not to give up. Life is short. And on a day of judgment, Allah has given us an example in the Qur'an that people will say, how long were you in your graves for? How long were you on earth for? How long did you stay on earth? And they will say to each other, we will say to each other, it seemed like a day or part of a day. Other people will say 10 days. Others will say only a little bit. Everything in this world, in the end, you'll look at it and say, because of a day or part of a day, I missed out on this great opportunity. And remember, once a person dies, there is no more returning back. Brothers and sisters, paradise. Paradise is the name of, of Firdaus, which is the highest place of Jannah. In Arabic, the Quran says Jannah. Jannah means gardens, because gardens brings peace to the mind. It brings serenity. It brings colors, beautiful smells, lovely oxygen. You think of birds. You think of play. You think of enjoyment. You think of free time. You think of beautiful weather. You think of feeling amazing. People these days, they go to holidays, to destinations where they can feel amazing. But in this world, everything is temporary. Paradise or Jannah in the Quran is repeated so many times. And it is not new to the Quran, for it is also in the books which Allah had sent before in all of human history. Paradise and Jannah is an unseen phenomena or an unseen promise. And human beings are affected by what they can see in front of them and what is around them. But Jannah is a promised unseen future. Yet, the only way to know about it is through revelation. Allah has to tell us about it through His messengers and prophets. People ask, how do I know that paradise even exists when I've never seen it? This is the problem with the human shallow thinking for some people. The human being often gets affected by looking at what's directly in front of them. But the intelligent human being who gives a little bit more thought with the faculties that Allah created inside of you, the intuition, the perception that you have, the intelligent cognitive and metacognitive thinking, if you know what that word means, inside a human being is able to think beyond what an animal can think. Beyond the surface, it's like a person looking at the ocean. You don't just think about the sea or the water that you see above you. Underneath it, there are many colors. There's a whole world. There are many fish. If you just put your head in a little bit, if you just snorkel a little bit, you'll see an array of a beautiful, colorful world. But if you just stay on the outside and watch the surface, all you will see is the shallow surface. So Allah calls us in the Quran to look beyond the surface, not just what you see in front of you. Many people, they resort to science 
to prove to them what exists and what doesn't exist. But little do they know, or little do they think, or little do they even care to give more thought that science is not the answer to everything. Science is merely a process based on observation, tests, and experiment to come to a conclusion of whether something exists or the process or the facts of the natural known world around us. It does not deal with supernatural things. It does not deal, for example, with feelings. It does not deal with perception. It does not deal with aesthetics. And for example, you might like a blue color. Other people might like pink. It does not deal with God and the supernatural world. It doesn't deal with souls. Science is not the answer to everything. However, science helps us understand the world around us, which then we have to think with our mind. It's called the cognitive system, the cognitive process, the perception of the human being, the inner thoughts of us, where you think around you and you reason, and you say to yourself, subhanAllah, what we have discovered around us, the universe, what's inside of us, what's around us, life and death, how we came to be in this life, the perfection of this world, the way that it creates and dies, and the way it lives and the way it interacts. A human being who thinks a little bit, will come to the conclusion that all of this has not been created haphazardly. It didn't just come out of naught, foolishness. It didn't just come by itself. And if it, is, if it, it came from somewhere, it has to have come from an intelligent being. And that intelligent being wouldn't just create it for no reason. There is a purpose. It's not just there for no wisdom. Brothers and sisters, we have the cognitive process of thinking, and we have the book of Allah, the revelation which Allah had revealed over and over again, to all the prophets before until finally Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats, there is a jannah, a hereafter, a paradise, and a hellfire. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Just think about it for a minute. Imagine that this world is just that, and that the only things that can take your right, anyone who does evil, anyone who does good, can you imagine a person who is a thief or a murderer or God forbid, a rapist, or whatever it is. All these people who kill and massacre, and then they die. Some of them even die comfortably. Some of them die with fortunes. Are they allowed to live their life in evil and do whatever they want and never be accountable? Do you think that makes sense, that this, the, the way this world is and its creation, when we think about it, when we analyze it, we think that this world is just there for people to live as they like and then die with no accountability? No ramifications, no consequence. The person who did good, that's it, just dies and loses out on everything. A person who did bad dies and gets away with everything if the law doesn't catch them. What is it that convinces you that something is wrong? If a person is evil by nature, what convinces them that the evil is wrong? What convinces them that raping is wrong? What convinces them that killing is wrong? Murder. What convinces them that robbing is wrong? What convinces them that... Uh, oppression is wrong if they believe it's right and they justify it in their heads. What convinces them? You're going to tell them it's bad. You're going to tell them it hurts people. They don't care. The only thing is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine revelation tells us, you are not going to get away with it. Allah tells us what's right and wrong and that there is a day of judgment in which each and every one of us will be accountable and it's one of two places. Paradise if you deserve it for your good work here or hellfire if a person knew the truth and insisted on being evil and then they deserve it. There is no way out of it. Allah did not create this world out of naught. And Allah tells us in the Quran, for example, those who don't believe that people will be resurrected on a day of judgment to be held accountable and then to either paradise or hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهُ قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٌ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٌ Allah says in Surah 36 verse 78 for example he strikes for us a similitude and forgot his own creation. He says, who will bring back life to the bones when they have decayed? Say, he who first brought them into being will bring them back to life the same way he brought them. He knows well about every kind of creation. Allah says, he strikes for us a similitude and forgot his own creation. He's talking to the disbeliever 
who denies that how will God or how are you going to be back alive after death? Allah says he forgot. He forgot how he was created in the first place. He forgot that he used to be a germ and then now he's a standing human being walking the earth. He forgot that he was dead one time and now he is alive. How did that happen? All he has to do is look backwards. How did you come here? Then Allah says, the one who made you from dead death the first time and brought you as you see yourself walking after your death a second time, he can resurrect you again. Say, the one who brought you the first time can bring you again. What's hard? The verses of the Qur'an tell us, for example, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُهُ وَهُوَ أَهُوَنُ عَلَيْهِ Allah then answers again, it is He, the one who began creation in the beginning, and then He can repeat the creation again, and Allah says, وَهُوَ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْهِ It is very easy for Allah, because when you look at the universe, Allah tells us in the Qur'an, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ Behold, the creation of the heavens and space, the skies, the celestial planets, the Milky Way, the galaxies, all of that is far greater of a creation than this mere human being. Allah is saying, look above. All that that boggles your mind. You think it's going to be hard for Allah to create a little puny human being? Allah says. So this is what we're talking about. Beyond just science, observation, thinking, perception, coming to conclusions, metacognition. Metacognition means thinking how to think, teaching how to teach, learning how to learn. Only a human being can do that, not an animal. And Allah says in the Quran, He gave you the faculties to think. So, brothers and sisters, we have this intuition that makes us know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa khtila fi layli wa nahari la ayati li uli al albab. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, heavens means the skies, and the earth, and the alternation of the night and the day are truly signs for people who ponder, who have a, a, a mind to think with. The ones who ponder and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth, and after that they look and they say, Oh, our Lord, you have not created this all for a foolish purpose. purpose. How perfect are you? Save us from the fire. This is the way a person thinks and then comes back and says, Wow, this Qur'an has got a lot to tell me. And among the things it tells us is the hereafter. Jannah and paradise is where we are working towards. Brothers and sisters, a person doesn't just sit down and says, I merely believe and I'm going to paradise. No, no, no. You have to work for it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Ala inna sil'atallahi ghaliya. Ala inna sil'atallahi hiya al-jannah. Behold, Allah's merchandise is very dear. Very expensive. Behold, Allah's merchandise is paradise. It's not cheap. It doesn't come in a cheap way. Only cheap things don't need work for them. You can just pick up pebbles off the floor, but try and get a diamond. You can pick up a rock from anywhere on the road. Why don't you go and get pure gold? Allah says, My merchandise, the Prophet said, Allah's merchandise is paradise. Not everyone can get it. And in the Sahih Hadith, which is in Bukhari, that Jibreel alayhi salam, the angel Gabriel, when Allah created Jannah, Jibreel went and looked at it. And he said, Oh my Lord, I don't think anyone who hears about this place would not want to come here. They're all going to race to it. They're all going to fight for it. They're all going to compete for it. Allah says, go and have a look again. He went and had a look and found that Jannah was, had a fortress, a metaphoric fortress. The fortress was called the things the human hates to do. Rasul said, Paradise has been covered and surrounded with the things that the human natural, the natural human hates to do. He hates to wake up for Fajr every morning because the sleep keeps you on your bed. He hates to stay away from food in Ramadan because fasting 
gives you a little bit of pain and annoyance. He hates to advise his family or his friends and remind them of good because he doesn't want to be told off or look like he's weird. He doesn't want to do the things that require the effort. doesn't want to donate and give in charity because the money is too valuable. He doesn't want to restrain his own character and his anger and his evilness because it's easier to let it out. And he says, I'm just getting it off my chest, otherwise I can't survive, even if it means harming other people. He doesn't want to do all that. He doesn't want to do all that. He doesn't want to strive. That's the human nature. Guess what? Jannah has been covered with that. What does it mean? It means if you want to get in, you have to get through the fortress. What is the fortress? The things you hate to do, which Allah commanded you to do. The things you want to do now is hellfire. Then Jibreel went and looked at hellfire. And he said, oh my Lord, nobody who hears about Jahannam, hellfire, and would ever want to go there. Allah says, go and have a look. He went and looked and it was covered with what? This time the opposite. It was covered with the fortress of the things that the human tempts, wants to do, temptations. He said, oh my Lord, I don't think anyone is going to be saved from it when he looked at the temptations that were there. So brothers and sisters, you want to cross the fortress, choose which one. For a temporary time in this life, we are breaking through the fortress of paradise and we're trying to stay away from the terrible, dangerous fortress that is surrounding hellfire. So, brothers and sisters, it's a struggle. But it is easy on those who really want it. When you want something, you'll get it. I can see some of our brothers here, mashallah, they're weightlifters. Some of them have big muscles. I see some of you, mashallah, about two years ago, you're a little bit overweight. Now you've worked on yourself. How did you get there? What's the secret? What's the secret? Anyone will tell you it was discipline and determination. I had to fight. I had to go through pain. I, you know those motivational talks? He listened to a lot of them in the morning. That's how we got there. You can't reach something without pain. But unfortunately, people are affected by what they see only in front of them. And we forget what is in store for us. Our life is running out. But they'll work for it. Think about that. Read the Quran more and Love the Jannah and what is in store for you, insha'Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And he says to us, Zuyyina lin-nasi hubbu shahawati minan nisa'i wal-banina wal-qanatiri al-muqantarati minan dhahabi wal-fiddati wal-khayli al-musawwamah والخيل المسومة والأنعام والحرث ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب قل أأنبئكم بخير من ذلكم للذين اتقوا عند ربهم جنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها وأزواج مطهرة ورضوان من الله وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ الصابرين والصادقين والقانتين والمنفقين والمنفقين والمستغفرين بالأسحار. Allah said in Surah Al-An'am, verse 14, humans, humans are naturally tempted by the lure. Of the opposite gender. Children, treasures of gold and silver, horses of mark, 
meaning great transportation. Cattle and plantations, crops and building and getting wealth. These are their enjoyments in the life of this world. But with Allah lies a goodly abode to return to. Say, shall I tell you of things better than these? For the God-fearing there are with their Lord gardens beneath which rivers flow. There they will abide forever, will have spouses of stainless purity as companions, and will enjoy the good pleasures of Allah. Allah thoroughly observes His servants. Allah thoroughly observes His servants. These are the ones who pray, O our Lord, we do indeed believe, so forgive us our sins and keep us safe from the chastisement of the fire. Men who are steadfast, truthful, obedient, spend in the way of Allah and implore the forgiveness of Allah before daybreak, meaning at Fajr. This sums up the entire purpose of this life and where we're heading and what Allah wants from you and how to get there. Allah is thoroughly observing his servants, meaning Allah is looking at every deed that you're doing all the way. Nothing is going lost. And paradise is only going to be perfectly deserving because Allah was watching and he thoroughly observes who deserves it and will destine them to it. And those for hellfire will destine them to it. Meaning Allah doesn't just pick and choose randomly who goes to paradise just like that. Since Allah monitors every deed, brothers and sisters, nobody can say, Oh, I love Allah, I love Islam, and that's it. And they do nothing about it. In fact, some people don't even care whatsoever about how they're living their life. Some people even think that they're Muslim just because of their bloodline. They think that because they're born from Muslim parents, that means they're Muslim. No. Islam is not inherited. Islam is an action and a belief and a conviction. And then a determination. And each individual is independent of their parents, of their bloodline, of their family, of their ethnicity, of their color, of their gender. And Allah says, وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدًا Every single individual will come to their Lord by themselves. Allah will not ask you about your brother or your sister or your family member or your friend or that person you worked with or your spouse or your children or your parents. He will ask you about you and yourself. And Allah is observing thoroughly. There are people who say, I am a Muslim, but they do everything that is not Islamic. There are people who say, I am Muslim, but do everything against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to believe in. There are people who call themselves Muslim, but they are a bit Christian, a bit Jewish, a bit Buddhist, a bit Hindu, a bit everything. What are they? You are either that or that. Allah says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَا يُقْبَلَ مِنْهِ Whoever seeks another religion other than Islam will not be accepted from them. It's either that or that. And you cannot accept part of the Qur'an and reject other parts. أَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ You believe in part of the book Allah said to the children of Israel before, and you disbelieve in parts of it. No, no, no. You either take it all or you don't. Even one verse of the Qur'an, if you reject it just because it doesn't fit my mind or your mind, you have disbelieved in Allah's words. If you're saying, God... 99% of your words are good, just that 1%, I can't live with that, I can't accept it. I'm not going to accept it. That means, that's exactly what Iblis the shaitan said to Allah. You have made Adam better than me, this is unfair, I believe you in every way, but not in this one, you are unjust. So he disbelieved in Allah, because he disbelieved in one of his attributes. How can you say Allah is unjust or doesn't know, just because of my feeble little mind can't understand it or comprehend it, or my little feelings are a bit hurt? Allah knows. Islam is not about feelings and desires and temptations. You don't just follow Islam the way you want. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the pure, sincere, honest Muslim. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the hadith al-Qudsi, Prophet said that Allah said, and the hadith is in Bukhari 7498. Allah said, I have prepared for my righteous slaves such excellent things as no eye has ever seen, nor an ear has ever heard, nor a human heart can ever think of. 
Do you know what it means to say, and no human heart can ever think of? There are two amazing things about that one statement from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu narrated on behalf of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Number one, does the brain think or does the heart think? The Quran and the Hadiths always talk about the heart thinking. The brain just captures the thoughts or either keeps them or lets them go. But the heart thinks. The heart thinks first and then the brain thinks. And alhamdulillah in science this is a new phenomenon now. This is a new discovery that the heart actually thinks before the brain. That's number one. Number two, the heart is more complex than the brain's thinking. The brain does not think feelings. It only produces the hormones and the neurotransmitters to enable our feelings. But the heart feels. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, in paradise, there are things that no heart has ever thought about, meaning no feeling has ever encountered in this entire world from the beginning of Adam to the end of time. No human has ever encountered such heartfelt th- feelings or thoughts. All the imagination, all the movies they ever put together, all the drawings and the images that every human has ever summoned and thought of and brought from their inner imagination, every artwork that you've ever seen, every imagination and dream that you've ever had, not one of them ever has ever thought in their heart about what things are in paradise. There are things in paradise nobody has ever even imagined in their heart. You know, sometimes you think to yourself, I have this feeling, but I can't describe it. I can't put it to words. Have you ever had that feeling? I want to, but I don't know what it is. I wish someone can explain it to me. The prophet, peace be upon him, is telling us even deeper than that. You haven't even encountered a feeling that you cannot explain That is what is in paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ, he talks to us and says through his revelation and through Jesus ﷺ and Moses and Abraham, all of them said this to us. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, one bow length. What's a bow a bow is just under a meter, or maybe a meter, or maybe less. He said, one of that length in paradise, whatever is under it, is better than the entire world and everything that is in it, in Jannah. You put a bow in Jannah, everything under that, all those little pebbles under it, all that grass, all whatever it is under it, is better than the entire world and whatever is in it. Is that what you're giving up on? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us now about three types of people who will enter paradise and their three different levels. Just in case some of my brothers and sisters here are thinking it's so hard to get there, I will now give you some ease from the Quran and see where you belong right now. Are you ready for this test? I'm going to give you three levels of believers. And each one of them will go to paradise eventually. And now is for you to judge, where are you at right now? The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to say, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُوا Judge yourself now. Hold yourself accountable now. Analyze yourself before you are judged and hold accountable on the day of judgment where there's no more return. Allah says in the Quran, Surely those who recite the book of Allah and establish prayer and spend privately and publicly out of what we have provided them look forward to a trade that shall suffer no loss. That's the beginning of the verse. What is that trade that will suffer no loss, brothers and sisters? What is a trade? What is a trade? In business terms. What is a trade? A transaction. Is it two-way? Buying and selling. You do something, you receive something, correct? Correct. Supply and demand. It's a two-way thing. Wouldn't it be foolish to invest your money in something that you know for sure will lose and then you keep investing in it? Wouldn't that be foolish? 
A person invests in things that will make them profit. And people love doing that in life. We all want something in return for whatever we do. Even in marriage. I did this for you. I don't feel that I'm being validated. No, that's what these fights always happen because of. Because people don't feel they're reciprocating or receiving back and forth. It's give and take. Life is give and take. That's how relationships are. Whether you like it or not. They say unconditional love. What does that mean? Love, you receive something back. When there's no love reciprocal, the person doesn't deserve your love. But Allah tells us in the Quran, just like people they trade in this life, Allah also says, Allah has offered you a trade. You improve yourself, do your salat, connect with Allah, have your relationship with Allah, do good, give charity, command good, prohibit evil to the best of your ability, strive and struggle. Get up and fight for that which is the right cause. Defend the weak and the innocent. Speak up for the people who are oppressed. Fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning injustice. Do what you can with your wealth, with your tongue, with your heart, with your mind, with your hands, with your wealth, with your body. Keep going, but only for goodness. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And stay away from that which is evil as much as you can and repent which what you're doing wrong. Allah says, I will give you a trade. What is the trade? A profitable trade that does not lose. Why does Allah say that? Because in life, there is one main difference between Allah's trade and the trade between human beings. Who knows the difference between the trade with Allah and the trade with the human beings? There is only one difference. Actually, two. But one main difference, and the other one is beyond our imagination. The first difference between the trade of a human being in this life material between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the trade with Allah will never ever lose. It will always be profitable. Wallahi, even if you saw an opportunity to take a harmful object off the road, that is a profit that will never lose for you, ever. Anything with Allah never loses. But with a trade with human beings, it's always subject to what? Profit and loss. With Allah, is there any loss? No. That's why another verse Allah says, Inna Allah ashtara min al-mu'minina anfusahum bi'anna malahum al-jannah. Allah purchased the, the life and the body of the believers in exchange for an eternal paradise. What does Allah want them to do? To fight, to sacrifice, to do good, to exert what He has. And Allah gave that to him. He gave us this blessing. And He wants us to use it in good. Do that, and He will give you in return an eternal paradise for the little that you do. And the little that you do is anyway from Allah because you couldn't have done it without Him. Can you imagine that? Someone gives you something. He gives you all this wealth and says to you, use it in a good way and profit from it. And you don't have to return that to me. And as a reward, just for profiting from the profit that I gave you, I'm going to give you all my inheritance and everything that I own. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you. I will bless you with eyes and mouth and, and everything in your life. And in return, use it in good. And I will give you in return an eternal paradise. It's a trade that we'll never lose. Allah then says, A trade in which they have invested their all so that Allah may pay them their wages in full and may add to them out of his bounty. Allah will add for you. He is most forgiving, most appreciative. Allah talks about himself. He says he is the most forgiving, the most appreciative. Why does Allah say he is the most forgiving? What is the point of that? And what is the point of saying most appreciative? Most forgiving means that Allah looks past your faults, meaning keep doing good with what Allah had given you. And you know those little mistakes that you make and little faults and the sins that you do? So long as you keep doing good, Allah will look past many of them. He won't even hold them accountable for you. You probably enter paradise and you say, but my Lord, I've done this and I've done that and I've done that. And Allah will say, don't worry about it. Just go. We're not even going to talk about it. Forgiving. Meaning he won't even mention it to you. People on the day of judgment will enter paradise and they'll say, I thought I didn't deserve it. Man, the scale, I had mountains of sins. And Allah would have told the angels, wipe it off. We're not even going to talk about it. I want him to enter paradise. That's what forgiving means. Allah is most forgiving, most appreciative. When someone appreciates something that you do, it doesn't mean that they need it from you. You know when someone says, I appreciate that, it doesn't mean they need it. They're trying to say that that's something that I respect, I like it, it's, it's good. Not because you've done anything for them. 
but because they want to honor you. I appreciate that. Or just at a form of you know, acknowledging that you do good work. Allah says he's appreciative, meaning that he will recognize every little deed that you do and he will reward you abundantly because he appreciates every little feeling you go through, every little struggle, every little tiny thing that you went through for a short time in this world. Then Allah says, O Prophet, the book we have revealed to you is the truth. The book we have revealed to you is the truth. Confirming the books that came before it. The Qur'an didn't bring anything totally new, brothers and sisters. Paradise, hellfire, day of judgment, one God, worship Allah, do good, stay away from evil. This is not new. It came with the same message that came to the prophets and the books that existed before. Why? Because the same God who brought you this Qur'an is the same one who has always been the one who was bringing the same message to all the prophets before. It's never changed. It's the same God, same way, same religion. And the religion is the way of Allah. Not made up by humans or ethnicity or a bloodline or a people or a man or a woman. It is Allah's, Allah's way and His laws. It's always been the same. Meaning that there's no change here. Nothing's new. Continue to go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah is well aware of His servants and sees everything. Then Allah says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْكَبِيرُ Allah says, then we bequeathed, meaning we gave over the book to those of our servants that we chose. Now, meaning the Muslims, they carried the Qur'an. And meaning the people who hear about Islam and read this Qur'an and they take it. The moment you take the Qur'an and believe in all of it, it means they believed in Allah's words, which means that you have inherited the words of Allah. That's what it means. The moment you believe in Islam, the moment you believe in the Qur'an, as the final book of Allah in every word, Allah has chosen you. through your Chosen you because in you, you are going to choose. And when you make that choice, Allah chooses you to be an inheritor of the book. That's the natural laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in place. Allah then says, now, here comes the three types of people. Now, some of them who took the Qur'an, some of the Muslims, some of the believers who took the Qur'an and inherited it. Some of them wronged themselves. That's the first category of people. Those who wronged themselves. And some follow the medium course. That's the second category of people. And some, by Allah's permission, race and compete with each other in acts of goodness. That's the third category of believers. Then Allah says... That is the great bounty. So now we have three levels of people Allah introduces to us among the believers. Number one, those who are unjust to themselves. Number two, those following the middle course. Number three, those excelling in good deeds. Which one's the highest? Those who excel in good deeds. The middle course and the lowest are the ones who wrong themselves. Subhanallah, it's so interesting the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sinners. He doesn't say they are sinners. He says they are unjust to themselves. As if to tell us, Allah didn't wrong you. You're wronging yourself. You're hurting yourself. As if to say to us, the only reason Allah forbid certain things, told us this is haram, is because it harms you. When you do the haram, you are harming yourself. You are being unfair to yourself. It's like saying, actually I'll give you the hadith of Prophet ﷺ. He said, I am to you, our Messenger Muhammad ﷺ said to his companions and to all of his ummah, to us, I am to you like a man who is sitting at night with a fire burning in front of him. He's lit up a fire. And he sees butterflies and insects 
flying towards the fire because they think it's food, they think it's nice, they think it's party, they think it's colorful, they want to go into it, they think it's good. But they don't know that the fire, if they come closer, it will burn them. And the man has kindness to the butterflies and all the insects. He keeps moving them away. He says, I am to you my ummah, those who follow me, my companions and those who follow me, like that man. You keep flying like those butterflies into the fire, and I have come to save you and keep you away from it, always telling you to stay away. And we, inshallah, inherit that from him by helping each other to stay away from the fire too. Your brother, your sister, yourself, to your family, to your parents, to your children, to your neighbors, to everyone that you can. Help them stay away from that. So now we move on. Who are these three people? Number one, those unjust to themselves. They are true believers, but sinful. Culprits, but not rebellious. Weak of faith, but not hypocritical and unbelieving at their heart. That's the first category. Those who wrong themselves are the majority of people today. They're the majority of Muslims, of believers. They're the ones who are always doing major sins. They're the ones who are neglecting their compulsory duties. But they're not hypocritical. Like you ask, they still believe in the Quran and Sunnah. They still believe in all of that. They're not committing acts of shirk. They're not polytheists. They're not doing things against their religion. They're not allying with enemies of Islam. You know, you see them, mashallah, when people are being oppressed, they stand up. And they say, for the sake of Allah, I will defend them and I look forward to paradise. Yet, if you look into their lives, or you look into, that, look into your own life, you find they're not really a person who is walking the path of paradise. Salat is neglected, probably prays Friday on, Friday off. The five daily prayers on and off. Ramadan, he just wants it to go very quickly. When it comes to hijab and covering yourself up for uh, women and the, the men covering your aura, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Messenger, وسلم, they have shortcomings in that. But when you come to ask them, and when they sit down, they don't want to be sinners. They don't like it. They still believe. This is the first category Allah talks about. The ones who are unjust to themselves. They inherited the Qur'an and Allah considers them inheritors of the Qur'an. The second category, those following the middle course. Who are they? They're less in number than the first category, but they are more in number than the last category. Those following the middle course. They are true believers and they have a combination of both the good and the evil actions in their life. At times they're very obedient other times, they let themselves free. So they're kind of casual. One moment, they have a long few weeks of mashallah. Then they go, the shaitan comes and says, take a break. Another whole week, few weeks of not mashallah. And then they come back to the mashallahs and then the not mashallahs. And then hope that they die when they're on the mashallahs. It's like gambling. Maybe, maybe not. I'll just take my chances. And so that's the middle class. The middle class, they do pray their five daily prayers. The middle class, they do fast their Ramadan and they appreciate it. They're a little bit better than the other ones. But they sometimes let themselves free with sins and stuff. Sometimes they fall into major sins and they come back. Or they'll go to Umrah and say, man, I need an Umrah. Why? I'm not going to tell you, man, but I just need an Umrah. I need one. I need a little surge of you know, Iman. It's that type. They're in the middle course. And now the final ones, those excelling in good deeds. They're the minority. They're the most special. They're the ones Allah praises all the time in the Quran. They're the ones who when Allah says, among the believers, Among the believers are true men. And it also means true women who were truthful to their promise and covenant they made with Allah. Some of them have already passed and died while worshipping in the cause of Allah and sacrificing and fighting 
fighting just cause. And some of them still await. Some of them are still waiting. This means two things. This was talking about the believers who went to the battle of Badr in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of them died as martyrs fighting the disbelievers when they attacked them from Mecca. And they were the best of martyrs. And Allah says, they've already passed. And Allah has already raised them. And he has shown them their enormous kingdom. And they wish to return, but Allah has, does not allow them to return because Allah has written, no one comes back to this world. And some of them are still waiting. And it also applies to the rest of the ummah till the end of time. Some of them, Allah creates them. And some of them are not born yet. Some of them have passed. And some of the great men and women are still coming. Why? They never change their promise. From the moment they're born to the moment they die, no matter when you meet them and see them, they're still, mashaAllah, on the straight path. Have you ever met people like that? They're the people who when they see a good deed, they don't care what people think, they race to it. And when they see someone beating them to it, they smile and make dua for them and say, I'm going to do even better. They never get jealous of people. They never compete because of materialism. If they do compete, they love what you have. If they debate with you and you debate with them, it doesn't become into a debate, it becomes into a discussion. And these types of people wish and hope that you are right and they're wrong. They will give from their own wealth and their own struggles to see you happy. Allah describes them. And they would deny themselves while they are in need in order for you to live. These people are very rare, but compared to the population of Muslims, nearly 2 billion, if you count them, they'll come out a big amount. But compared to the past, they're still very rare in proportion, in ratio. Allah describes this excelling people in the Quran. Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ فِي جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ Allah says in Surah Al-Waqi'ah verse 10, As for the foremost... They will be the foremost. They shall be near stationed to their Lord in the gardens of bliss. A large number of them from the ancients and a few from them from the latter times. It means those who are foremost, meaning those who used to race to do good deeds ahead of others. In this life, that was their character. They don't sit there waiting for others to run. They're the first. They don't sit there for other ones to voice. They voice. They don't sit there for others to get up and defend. They defend. And they don't sit there saying, why didn't you? And they don't pass the blame on anyone else. They're just happy that they did their little part. Allah says, those on the day of judgment will be the foremost as well. So if you're foremost here, you'll be foremost there. If you are the first to salat, you'll be the first to paradise there. If you're the first in charity here, you'll be the first of the doors of charity there. If you are the best in fasting, you'll be the best of the doors of fasting there. If you are the quickest to defend and protect and to uphold, you'll be the first one to be closer to Allah. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ explains this. He says, the hadith is Musnad Ahmad. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do you know who on the day of resurrection will be first to be accommodated under the divine shade of Allah? They said, Allah and His Messenger know best, Ya Rasulullah. He said, those who were such that when the truth was presented before them, they accepted it. Forthwith, when a right was asked of them, they discharged it gracefully, and their decision in respect of others was the same as in respect of their own selves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Jannatu adni yadkhulunaha. يُحَلَّوْنَ فِيهَا مِنْ أَسَاوِرَ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَلُؤْلُؤَا وَلِبَاسُهُمْ فِيهَا حَرِيرٌ وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَنِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ they shall enter the everlasting gardens, shall be adorned with bracelets of gold and with pearls, 
and their apparel therein shall be silk shall be silk they will say allah they will say all praise be to allah who has taken away all sorrow from us all the sorrow that we had gone through surely our lord is most forgiving most appreciative allah then says alladhi ahallana dar al muqama min fadlihi la yamassuna fiha nasabun wa la yamassuna fiha lughub the lord who out of his bounty has made us dwell in an abode wherein no toil, no fatigue will ever affect us ever again. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather the people on the Day of Judgment in, three, in two rows and some in the front. The Prophet ﷺ said, Those who have excelled in good works shall enter paradise without accountability. So the three stages. Those who excelled will enter paradise without what? Without accountability. And those who are following the middle course, the second people that I told you about, shall be subjected to accountability, but their accountability shall be light. How will it be light? Allah will look at all your good deeds, if you're the middle class, and all your bad deeds. And He will reward you collectively for your good deeds, and He will look at your bad deeds collectively. He won't hold you accountable for every little bad deed that you did. As for the third group, as for those who have been unjust to themselves, they shall be detained throughout the long period of resurrection and accountability, the mahshar. Then Allah shall cover them also, finally, with His mercy. And they are the ones who will say, thanks to Allah who has removed sorrow from us. Only Allah knows how long the day of judgment will be for those people. But brothers and sisters, don't misunderstand this verse. Those who are unjust to themselves and those who are in the middle course, even those who excelled, but it's very rare for the ones who excelled, there is an exception. Some of them will also end up in hellfire for a little while. There are many numerous hadiths and ayat in the Qur'an which warn of a punishment in hellfire for certain people, no matter which category you're in, but mostly in the first two, the ones who are unjust and the ones who go with the middle course, such as the people who died with major sins and never repented from them. They're continuing their major sin until death, such as murder and never repented or did something about it, adulterers, fornicators, riba, consumers, and so on. These are all people, the hadiths, the sunnah, and the ayat of the Qur'an have warned of hellfire. And these types of Muslims and believers will enter, but then they will be saved eventually. And when they are saved eventually, the last of them will enter paradise. I'll finish it with this very quickly, inshallah, if the adhan can wait two, three minutes. Up to the last of them, they will enter paradise. Rasul sat with his companions, the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And he said to them, Wallahi, I know the last man that will be saved from the fire and the last man to enter paradise. So tell us, Ya Rasulullah, tell us. He said, he will be taken out and walking across the Sirat. And he would have just made it past. And he is the only one left still looking at the fire. His deeds weren't enough to move him away. And he's just trapped right there. Then Allah makes a tree grow at a distance. And the man sees it. And he hadn't seen a tree in shade for such a long time then the man will not be able to be patient. And Allah knows that the human cannot be patient with something like that. That's why he did it. So then he says, my Lord, can you put me? Please, he says, my Lord, put me under that tree so that I can be in its shade. I haven't seen shade in such a long time. Allah says, I will put you, but on condition you don't ask me for anything. After that, he says, I will not ask you. He puts him under that tree. Then after a while, Allah makes another more magnificent tree grow at a distance from his sight. He says, my Lord, after a long time, and Allah knows no human can be patient with it, just put me under that tree, and I promise you, I will not ask you for anything. Allah will say to him, didn't you already promise? What kind of a human are you? He says, my Lord, I promise you, this time this will be it, this will be it, this will be it. So Allah then puts him there, on condition he doesn't ask for again. After that magnificent tree, Allah makes a third magnificent tree, even bigger and more beautiful and with a stream underneath it. After a long time, the man says, Ya Rabb, I know I promised you. And Allah says, what this time? He says, just put me under that tree. I will never ask you for anything, my Lord. 
And Allah says, a debate starts to happen back and forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, it's deliberate. So he puts him under that tree finally. While he puts him under that tree, he is close to the door of Jannah. Then he hears noises from behind that door. Beautiful noises never heard before. Sounds of happiness and joy, laughter. Then Allah, then he says after a while, My Lord, just let me see what's inside behind that door. <laughs> and Allah knows that he cannot be patient. So then he says, I'll let you see, go. He goes and sees and he comes back out. And he is very sad, very tearful and very depressed. He says, what is wrong, my servant? And he says, my Lord, I realize that I'm the last person. <laughs> and there's no space left for me in paradise. The guy was going to ask for something in paradise as well. So then Allah says, go in there. Would you like me to give you from it as much as the world? And then the man says, Wallahi, the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. He says, bi ya Rabbi. What, now you're mocking me, my Lord? You're just teasing me now? The Prophet Muhammad sallam, as he was saying this hadith, he laughed. They said to him, why are you laughing, ya Rasulullah? He says, inni adhaku li dahiki Rabbi. I am laughing to the laughter of my Lord. Before we imagine laughter of the Lord, we cannot imagine it, brothers and sisters. We just accept it as it is, without giving interpretation. But it's a positive thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laughs in a manner that befits him. We don't understand, we cannot comprehend or even give explanation. And he says to him, Oh no, my servant, but my kingdom never runs out. How about I give you as much as the world and like it Again and again and again and again. Five times and the man says, stop, stop, all right, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. In another hadith it says, as I am Muslim, it says as much as the world ten times. Sorry, he repeats it five times and he says, and you will have ten times as much as this, five times as much as the world. So five times ten is fifty times as much as the world. For the last man that enters paradise, he enters it and he lives in his beautiful palace and everything. And then they said, Ya Rasulullah, if that's the last man, what will be for the people up in the highest places of paradise? Says, ah, Allah says, that is beyond what anyone can even perceive. The hadith is long. But which one do you want to be, brothers and sisters? It's time to race. It's time to compete. It doesn't cost you anything. Jannah is for free, but it just needs your sincerity. It needs your patience. It needs your perseverance. It needs less complaining and more doing. Keep going, brothers and sisters. The time is short and soon it will run out. It's flying and in a matter of time, all your sorrows and sadnesses will go. And I end it with this beautiful hadith of Prophet He said, it'll, the, the saddest and most tra traumatized person in the world who never saw any goodness in his life will be brought to paradise and placed only once in there. Within that one, just placed in and taken out. And a man will say, Oh my Lord, I have not seen a single sad day in my life. He gets amnesia and forgets every sadness he's ever been through. One other person we dipped once into hellfire and taken out. The person who has never seen any sadness or sorrow in this world, only comfort all his life and will have amnesia as well and say, I don't recall any comfort in my life. Brothers and sisters, compare the two. Do you want to be close to Allah? Or do you want to be the ones behind? Or the ones who fail? Work for it. Keep going. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our good deeds and forgive our shortcomings. Bless our brothers and sisters around the world. Those who are in strife. Our brothers in Palestine. Our children of theirs who are our children, their family who is also our family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them, grant them the greatest of all rewards for their patience and perseverance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us as well and know our shortcomings and our inabilities even though our hearts are with them. And we would love to give them victory and support them as much as we can, but only within our power. So let us work with what we have right now within the circle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in and do our best with the blessings which He has given us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you, brothers and sisters. Hada wa sallallahu wa nabina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akin as-salam.